Okay, um, welcome to, uh, we're doing this, to this. Uh, so did the, did the sermon this Sunday. We actually had a lot of uh, sound issues in our service this Sunday. Um, probably hurt some, some, some of the older people's ears with, with some of the stuff going on. Uh, just turned out turned out to be not not a great Sunday for our sound. Uh, no fault of the boys, no fault of the of the the music guys. Just for whatever reason, we just had issues. So um, had some issues also in terms of went to post the message for this last week and there was no sound. So I decided to just quickly preach through it again. Uh, it's part of our series, so I, I feel it's important to be in the series. Uh, so that those that are following along can. And I know it's not a lot, but the Lord will use, the Lord uses it as he uses it. So um, he, I just, uh, this morning, I felt like I should walk through this. Uh, so the last couple Sundays, we have been going through uh, This We Believe. Um, and uh, last Sunday, we we looked at um, how God created all all things for the purpose of spending time in relationship with us. That is one of the core reasons why God made the universe was to spend time with us. Um, and when we need to recognize recognize that 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 the earth the 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 sun the moon the stars our days our day to day air and kind of the thing the, what you know just our day to day life it, everything that takes place on earth and in this creation was a means for God to spend time with us it's a medium for us to spend time in relationship with God so God is uh, everything that He did in the garden everything that He does even in, towards the new heaven and the new earth. All of it is towards relationship with man. God is moving all things towards a relationship with man. And we see in the Garden of Eden, God set everything up for that. And uh, this week, uh, we're going to look at the other side of God. Yes, God wants relationship with us. He is a loving, relational God. He absolutely wants relationship with us. But there's this other side of God, too, that plays into this. And so we're kind of looking at the two kind of natures of God this and, and I mean he's he has one nature, but two kind of core attributes of God, if you will. One is that God is a loving God who wants relationship with us, and then this the, what we're going to talk about today. That but also God is a holy God, and of course this is going to play into everything. Even as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we live out the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we as we walk with the Lord, we're gonna we're, we have to pl- we have to make sure that we are uh, thinking and including. Both of these, and we're not getting too far just on one side and not recognizing the other. And so this is very practical for um, our churches, very practical for our walk with Jesus Christ today. God is a relational God of love who made all things and is moving all things towards the purpose of developing and having daily relationship with himself and mankind, with each of us, with you and with me. And I pray that you're living that. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that you are, you recognize fully, you believe with great conviction that God is wanting daily relationship with you today, that the sun rose today because in God's mind, I want to spend time in loving relationship with my creation, with my with my Adam, with my whatever your name is. God wants to spend time with you. That's why he allowed today to happen. Now, in our day-to-day, we forget that all the time. We always have things that we need to do in our day, but we need to understand that God's view is what matters. God's purposes is what purposes are what matters, and we need to recognize that. So God puts Adam and Eve in the garden to have relationship with them. And God is still walking and endeavoring to walk in relationship with us today. Uh, but we also see that, that, that as, as, the, as we go through Scripture, and even before we get to the, the, the kind of the end of, of chapter 3 of Genesis, we also realize and we start to be, um, it is also revealed to us that God is not just a, a God of creation, and all power, eternal might in order to create this universe. He's also a God of relationship and love who wants to have relationship with man. And number three, God is a holy, righteous God. God is fully and truly the standard in character and holds the standard of what holiness is. Our God is, 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 is um, he is just as much loving relational as he is holy, righteous. And so by the end of the chapter three in, 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 um, in Genesis, we start to see these these this truth starting to bear um, 
you know, uh, bear on the what's taking place for humanity or speak into, direct what is taking place for humanity. So picture God making the universe and setting it all up and even making a garden, a perfect place for man to experience his love and his righteousness, his goodness and relationship. Everything is good. In fact, pay attention that when God gets to um, kind of the end of chapter 1 there, okay, look at the last couple of verses of chapter 1, if you go to uh, Genesis 1, 31, and, uh, and, and then kind of into, into the beginning verses of chapter 2, recognize that God sees everything that he makes, and he doesn't just go, okay, it's good. But him knowing that he's engaged in this relationship, he's going to be with Adam and Eve, they're, they're going to be able to learn from him and grow, from, grow with him, and he's going to be able to relationship with them. And everything that he's made, he doesn't just say it's good, he says it's very good. It is very good. Guys, now I know <clears throat> that there's a, a lot that goes on between between Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 and, and you know the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if you're a follower of Jesus today, I pray that you understand that in Jesus Christ, we now, okay, we now can look at our day and despite what's going on, we can look around and go, now being restored to relationship with the God of heaven who created us, no matter what I'm going through, I can look around and I can go, it is not just good, it is very good, and it is very good because of Jesus Christ. Because I walk daily with the God who created me, who is good, who is very good. And I pray that as you live life walking in Jesus Christ, that you take time to stop and to recognize my God is very good. And that I, we can kind of reciprocate that back to God now through Jesus Christ. But before Adam fell, it was very good. Before Adam and, C and Eve sinned, it was very good. Genesis 1, 31. And God saw that everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. That's Genesis 1, 31. It was very good. Before Adam and Eve sinned, God saw that what he had made was good, and it was good. Picture God spending time with Adam daily in the garden. We talked about this last week. I'm not going to go over the whole message, but uh, re recognize that relationship between man and God. It was very good. And we must remember that it was very good because God was holy. And at that point, man was also holy and untainted by sin, right? That's why it was so good. But then Adam and Eve in their freedom chose to disobey God and go in and go their own way. We're not going to read that passage. You know the story likely. If not, read, uh, read through Genesis 1, 2, and 3. After this, after Adam and Eve fell, we see quickly and clearly in Scripture that God is not just a loving relational God, but also a holy God of righteousness. The, the God of the Bible predominantly has two core attributes that seem to shape all he does, all he did in the past, in terms of Adam and Eve and all that took place there, all the way through the flood, uh, the, the, the patriarchs, the Israel, uh, coming out of Egypt and, 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 and all of that, uh, Israel and Judah and the two nations uh, going into exile, coming back, sending Jesus Christ, the church age, and even into the future with Revelation and his, his, his coming return, then the millennial period, the, 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 the new heaven and the new earth after all of that. These two natures are at work together simultaneously. And if you pay attention to both of them, you see that these two natures is what's shaping the entire course of human history. What God is trying to do and engage in is this, is to walk in relationship with mankind who are free and now fallen into sin, but also to maintain and, un, and be unwaveringly, unwaveringly, uh, uh, connected to his holiness. We see that God is unwilling to compromise, and we see this in the Garden of Eden when Adam, when he kicks Adam and Eve out, and we see this by sending Jesus Christ, and we see this even in Revelation and the return of Jesus Christ and the new heaven and new earth and the judgment, eternal hell. 
we see that God is unwilling to compromise his holy righteousness in order to be relational. I'm going to read that again because, guys, in our day and age, I think this truth is under attack. And we need to be very clear on this. And we need to understand this in our own hearts as we live day by day and let this truth shape how we engage other people. And, but also and, and, and how we understand who our God is. And in, in terms of walking in the righteousness that we have been given, we've been given righteousness by Jesus Christ, but we're called to walk in it. And we should, we should be serious about that. We see that God is not willing to compromise on his holy righteousness in order to be relational. We see that. God, is ab- God in absolution is both a loving relational God and a holy righteous God. He is both. If you take any uh, any one of these or diminish, if you take any one of these away or diminish one of these and, and like make superior the other one, you are changing who God reveals himself to be and you are making yourself an idol. And you're calling it God or you're calling it Jesus, but it is not the Jesus or the God of the Bible. The God of Scripture and of this universe is equally both. And we better not forget it. He is a God of loving relationship and he is a God of holy righteousness. And he is not willing, he is not willing to compromise his holy righteousness in order to have relationship. God is a God of holiness. Let me just share a little bit about his holiness, just aspects of it so that we understand uh, that we understand how holy God is. Moses in Exodus 33, and I'm going to do this in narrative form, um, uh, kind of just stories out of the scripture where we see like, wow, this holiness is a, is a big thing. It's, it's, it's an important thing. In Exodus 33, uh, Moses asked to see God in his full glory and power. But God says in, in, in uh, Exodus 33, 21 uh, to 23, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put, in, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand. I'll cover over you with my hand as I walk by until I pass by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back or you shall see the backside of where I've been. But my face you shall not see. I add that because in the Hebrew, it can be argued that God allowed Moses not to necessarily see his back, his literal back. But what Moses saw is, 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 is God's, because God is spirit, uh, God's basically where God had been, the backside of where God had been. And not his butt or his backside, but like where he had been. And the language there would suggest that basically then uh, what Moses saw was the reflection of God's glory and power and holiness from the rocks and from where he had passed by. Either way, with you, whether you believe he actually saw kind of the back of God or if he kind of saw the backside of where God had been. Either way, when Moses comes down off the mountain, his face shines with the glory and power of God. And we read in Exodus 34, uh, 29 to 35, that Moses' face shone with such glory and purity that it scared the people. And so he covered his face with a veil. Now, why did his face shine? His face shone with the glory and the purity that shines from an all-powerful, holy God. It literally makes Moses' face shine. That is the kind of holy, powerful glorious God that we serve. Isaiah the prophet was given a vision into the throne room of God. And this is what he said, Isaiah 6, 1 to 5, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another, listen now, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, Isaiah says, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. 
for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah realizes that his uncleanliness, his sin, and, 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 and Isaiah was a righteous prophet. He was a righteous man. He was doing probably far better than most in his day. Yet when he stood in front of the throne of God and he saw and he heard the angels calling out, declaring the holiness of God, he was undone. He was undone, recognizing that he might be righteous, but he's nothing like that. He is nothing like that. In fact, there is such a distance between him and between God or him and God in that sense of holy, righteous glory that he was undone. And he thought, I'm, I'm dead. I'm done. He also hears the seraphim calling out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Most students of the Bible do not believe that I, Isaiah was witnessing a one-time event here. But rather that the scene with the seraphim calling out in testimony and in praise of God's holiness is something that happens all the time in the throne rooms of heaven. Support for this is seen in Revelation 4, 8 and 11, where we see John has a vision of God's throne room. And he's, he writes this in Revelation 4, 8 to 11, it's very similar. Each one of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who he, um, Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, uh, the 24 elders fell down before him who sit on the throne um, and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they are created and have their being. John also sees angels declaring the nature and the being of our God. And what, is the, what do they declare? What are the angels even today declaring in the throne room of heaven as we are about doing our thing? And some of us, distracted heavily by just the regular things going on and forgetting that in heaven right now there are angels declaring holy 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 is the lord god almighty right the number three is used to uh, accentuate no doubt the triune nature of god to clarify that each member of our god who is one is holy that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all holy. Our triune God is holy. Yes, He's a God of love. Yes, He's a God of relationship, but He is holy. Note verse 8 of that passage. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Guys, understand that although we know that our God is a God of love and relationship, and that he is a God of great grace. And we have been received, we have received grace through Jesus Christ if we put our trust in him. And we want people all around us to receive the, gr the grace of Jesus Christ and to, and to give their lives to him, to make that decision. This is how we are saved. We recognize that what, what we have been saved by grace, that he has paid. Our panel, there's nothing that we have done that cannot be forgiven. Praise the Lord. And then we say, God, take my life. You're going to be Lord of it, not me anymore. Take my life. My life is yours. Thank you for forgiving me. Please forgive me and thank you for forgiving me. Right? We repent and then we give our lives to Jesus. If you have done that, I know you know. And I know that through the Spirit, you have a heart for everyone to find Jesus in the same way. But as we focus on sharing the love and the relationship of Jesus Christ that he wants with us and that he wants with everyone and the grace that it comes by, through God's grace we are saved, nothing else. As we, are, we, as we share that and as we preach and teach and, and tell our neighbors, our neighbors about that, and even as we live out Christ, we better not forget that he, even though a God of love and grace and relationship, is a God of holy righteousness of holy righteousness throughout scripture there's many passages and you're like okay we get it already but i just want you to make sure you get this 
1 Samuel, there's many passages that talk about God's holiness. 1 Samuel 2, 2, there is one holy, sorry, there is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Psalms 69, 9 says, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. His holiness is a reason enough for us to, to spend our lives in worship. Do you get that? Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. We should live our lives for, for, for no other reason than just to give God ho- worship because he is holy. And then he also says, tremble before him all you earth. So because of this holy righteousness of God, not only are we called to worship him, but we're also called to tremble before him. And this isn't the, this isn't the, the, this is a reverent fear of the Lord. Why? Because he is all powerful and holy. He is a holy God. Now, we don't need to fear. First John says that perfect love casts out fear. If we understand the love of God, we don't need to fear in a, in a way that we're fearing condemnation or we're fearing, um, you know, judgment. We don't need to fear that way. Perfect love does cast out fear. But as we ponder and worship God for his holiness, we should always have a reverent fear of the incredible God that we serve because he is a holy all-powerful God. First Peter 1, uh, 15 and 16, it says, But just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And I love that Peter does this. What I love about this passage is that he's actually taking from the Hebrew, uh, and our, our most of our Bibles kind of clarify that. It's in brackets, be holy because I am holy. And it's in brackets because Peter's drawing from the Old Testament, which is in Hebrew, which I am is Yahweh. So then Peter is really saying, be holy because Yahweh is holy. Be holy because I am is holy. Because I am holy. And I love that. And we are called to live in Christ, recognizing that we have been purified and that we stand before uh, God, the Father, the Judge, sanctified in Christ. We, he has put on his holy cleanliness and we have given him our dirtiness and our sin. And he's taken that to the cross for us already. So we are put on his, we are given his purity. But even in the righteousness that we have given, we are called to recognize that we follow a holy God. Therefore, be holy as your God, who you follow, who you serve, who you live in this daily relationship with. He's holy, so be holy. Hebrews 12, 14 says this, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. This is in Hebrews 12, guys. Hebrews 12, 14. This is in our scriptures. It says, strive for peace. So be striving, be pushing, be fighting, guarding your hearts and helping others, right? Be in the battle, striving for peace with everyone, okay? And for the holiness. So that means and also we are to be striving for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, do we need to strive because we're not saved? Is this a striving in order to find our salvation? Sorry about that. Give me a sec. There we go. No, we are saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ. So this is a striving for our salvation. But it is a striving to walk in the holiness of Lord. Guys, it's a battle with the flesh. This is why we need to take up our cross and follow Jesus Christ, denying ourselves, going to the word of God, resisting Satan and his temptations, and we need to fighting the battle. This is, this is Ephesians 6. Put on the full armor of God. Why? Because it's a battle to walk in the holiness of the Lord. We are given it in Christ. But now we need to walk in it. And it's not that we're not saved. It's not that we need to become saved by this. No, it's recognizing that as a follower of Jesus Christ, I follow him daily and him, he, my Jesus is holy. Where he is walking is towards holiness. Therefore, if I'm following him, it's going to be battling towards holiness, battling the old nature and battling Satan and walking in holiness. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which 
no one will see the Lord. Yes, God is a loving God of relationship, but he is also a holy God, and he will not compromise his holiness and righteousness in order to have a relationship with man. God didn't do it in the garden. Adam and Eve, they were kicked out of the garden. Genesis 3, 23 and 24 says, God banished Adam and Eve from the garden. Verse 23 says, So the Lord God banished uh, him from the garden, talking about Adam of Eden, to work the ground for which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed uh, on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. We see that the relationship and that the, we see that the relationship and the walking together in the garden daily between Adam and God and Eve ended. And know that God does not interact with Adam in the same way as he did with Adam and Eve. Or so he doesn't he doesn't interact with mankind in the same way that he did with Adam and Eve again until about 4000 years later when Jesus Christ is on the scene and he walks up to his disciples and he says follow me in which daily they follow jesus christ in a loving relationship of learning his listen now listen now learning his way his truth and his life like jesus christ said i am the way the truth and the life so they walked with god daily learning from god his way his truth and his life and guys that way that truth that life that jesus is intrinsically interwoven with the holiness and righteousness of God. You cannot separate Jesus from the holiness and righteousness of God. You cannot set walking in a relationship with Jesus Christ from the holiness and righteousness of God. You cannot walk, you cannot separate the 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 daily being willing to learn and grow in Christ from holiness and righteousness. Yes, God was present and showed up in a clear way in the Old Testament, and God has shown up all the way through. But that daily walking with God that Adam, Adam and Eve had didn't happen until Jesus Christ. Here on this earth, face to face, body to body, in the cool of the day, didn't happen until Jesus Christ came and called his disciples. God doesn't compromise his holiness for a relationship with Adam and Eve and, and note, he did not do it in Noah's time, right? You know what happened. He did not do it with the patriarchs in that time. He did not do it with the, with the first generation he pulled out of Israel that he saved through the Red Sea. When they were unwilling to trust and unwilling to follow, he, he, he took 40 years and allowed that generation to die before he continued. He didn't do it with the nation of Israel or Judah, he sent them into exile, and he didn't do it uh, in the New Testament with the rich young ruler who said, what do I have to do to be saved? And Jesus said, sell everything you have and come follow me. And he went away sad. He didn't chase him down. He didn't say, you know what? 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 I was being a little harsh there. Let's just do this relationship thing. No. He didn't do it with Ananias and Sapphira. And guys, look through. He didn't do it with the false prophets in, in Paul's and Peter's and John's day. And we see in Revelation that God won't do it. He won't compromise at the end. That there's a judgment coming for man. He's not going to compromise his holy righteousness just to have relationship with man. The action, kind of going back to Adam and Eve, uh, the action of God kicking Adam and Eve out of the garden was to keep them from taking the tree of life that's outlined there but it's also symbolized the it also symbolized the division there is now between a holy god and sinful man sin brought death and separation of relationship with god mankind from that day by nature would want to go their own way and instead of seeking and trusting god would trust themselves their own thinking and would seek after their own desires instead of seeking after god leaning on their own understanding, and in so doing, furthering their separation from our holy God. We are by nature separated, but man engages in how he lives to further separate himself from our holy God. And we know that this is true. We know that man is separated from God due to sin. Romans 5.12, therefore, and all men are, 
therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, it's talking about Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all men sinned. James 1, 14 and 15 says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires. And guys, we have evil desires and enticed. Then after their desires have has conceived and after then after desire has conceived it gives birth to sin and sin then when it's fully grown gives birth to death and death is really the ultimate death is separation we understand this now even with when someone dies in your family what happens you're separated from them death is separation death is also separation from god and death outside of jesus christ is eternal separation from uh, in, in in hell for eternity. If you don't want God, if you're not willing to embrace Jesus Christ, you're not going to have to. He's not going to force you. And he's not going to compromise his holiness and say, you know what? Why don't you just, I know you didn't want me. I know you don't want anything to do with me. You don't want a relationship with me. I know you want to live your own desires, but you know what? I'm going to force you into heaven anyway. He's not going to do that. Death brings separation. Sin brings separation between us and God. We believe then that our God is holy and pure of sin, but we as humans are sinful and full of, of sin and self. Note that from Genesis 3 to Revelation 22, which covers humanity's history and future into eternity, God is at work reconciling these two absolutely huge parts of his nature. His desire to live in a loving relationship with man and his unwillingness to compromise his holiness. Guys, this is why Jesus Christ came, right, to earth. In his love, God sent Jesus, even while we were still sinners, to come and die on the cross and take our sins and our punishment and condemnation to, on the cross so that our sins would be paid for righteously, right? Justly, holy. He did it in a way that is holy. It is righteous. It is what is right, good, just, and true. He did not compromise by sending Jesus Christ. But he took our place, Jesus Christ took our place so that we could have life, eternal life with him. By faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we are given the holy righteousness of Jesus Christ as he is given our sin and punishment on the cross. There is love and grace going on in the gospel message as there is equally as much holy righteousness taking place and being displayed. I'm going to read that again. There is love and, and grace going on in the gospel message as much as there is holy righteousness being displayed. More and more in our day, people are preaching and teaching and talking about a gospel that focuses predominantly and some only on the grace and love and the relationship aspect in connection to Jesus. And they ignore or at least leave out a profoundly huge part of who God is. And that is his holiness and his unwillingness to compromise his holiness and righteousness. Just to have relationship with mankind. Right? Many today talk about the love and grace and relationship of Jesus Christ. And they leave out the call for us who are in Jesus Christ to live Holy in Jesus Christ. This new grace only gospel is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not the gospel of the Bible. This is, this is dangerous because to make God's holiness, listen now, listen now, to make God's holiness smaller or less significant also makes his grace and love smaller too. Did you hear me now? To, to diminish God's holiness is also to diminish his grace. If God is not really all that concerned with his holiness because of his grace and love, why do we even need his grace? If God's holiness is like way up here, if God is that holy, then it took that much grace to send Jesus Christ to die on a cross for our sins. It takes a profound amount of grace. The more holy God is, the more grace is needed and poured out through him, by him. It is a beautiful thing. But to diminish his holiness and say it's all about grace, guys, you actually diminish the, diminish the grace. That is why the more people are, try to make the gospel seem more attractive to the sinner, which I understand why we do, 
But, but the more we do that and leave out holiness, the more it becomes evident that a person doesn't really need that much grace. Why do I even need this whole system? We need it, guys, because God is absolutely holy. And without the holiness of Christ given to you by faith in him, by you repenting and giving your life to him, he can change you, he can save you, he can take all that rubbish, he can forgive it. But without recognizing his as absolute holiness, you will not see God. It's not just about love and grace. It's not just about relationship. The more you diminish God's holiness, the more you diminish our need for grace. And that's why you see people in the, in the church today, uh, you know, uh, all about the grace of God. But when you look at their life, there's absolutely no holiness. They're not really following a holy God. Don't be deceived. God is not just a God of loving relationship, but also a God of a universally transcendent holiness and righteousness. To make God anything less than absolutely and chiefly concerned with holiness, as he desires a loving relationship with us, is to reject the scriptures and to make our own false God. Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for our sins, and when he and when we repent for our sins and put our faith in him as Savior and Lord, we are welcomed into a daily relationship with Jesus Christ through the person of the Holy Spirit. And that relationship is rooted in love and holiness. Or you could say in loving holiness. And through that daily relationship, we learn by faith to follow Jesus Christ, who we've given our life to. And we've chosen to serve with the rest of our lives. And he leads and guides us. And he shows us his way, his truth, his life. John 14, 6, and Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Understand clearly and don't let anyone tell you differently because the Bible doesn't tell you differently. That that way, that truth, and that life in Jesus Christ, as you follow him, is always in and always towards the holy righteousness of God. Yes, it is in love, but it is always towards the holy righteousness of God. I'm going to leave you with these scriptures in closing. 2 Timothy 2.2 2. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure, a holy heart. 1 Timothy 6, 11 to 12. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Pursue righteousness. Right? Romans 12, 1 and 2. <coughs> I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, be pre um, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is, is good and acceptable and perfect will. We believe that our God is a loving, gracious, holy, righteous God who desires a relationship with us daily through Jesus Christ. He, Jesus Christ, will lead us into his love by his grace and lead us into God's holy righteousness as we follow him and submit our lives to him. And he'll do this. He'll call us into this loving holy righteousness in all we do and in all we say as our lives purpose 
becomes more and more to walk in love and righteousness with him daily. I pray you guys get that. I pray you get that. Have a good and have a good day. Have a very good day. Remembering that God wants and made this day for relationship with you out of his love and grace. And his desire is that he walks with you and that you walk with him, following him through Jesus Christ. As you walk together in his holy righteousness. That's what we're called to. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is good news. It is gospel. I can walk today with the loving, holy, righteous God of heaven who saved me and forgave me. And he continues to, whenever I screw up and do stupid and sin, He, I run to him, I say, Lord, please forgive me. He forgives me. He removes the sin. And I get to walk with him. And guys, that gospel, that good news is very good and allows us to have very good days despite the struggles, despite the trials. Guys, have a that kind of very good, Jesus-filled, holy, loving, relationship-filled, righteous-filled day.